Hi, everybody. My name is Jim Knight, and I am absolutely delighted today to be uh, talking with one of my good friends, Kristen Anderson. Kristen Anderson go way back, and she goes back before me. Uh, she is, without question, one of the most broadly uh, educated people when it comes to instructional practice in the classroom. She worked with numerous leaders in the field of, of instruction. Um, uh, most recently, and she may correct me on this, but John Hattie, she's a deep, deep understanding of Hattie's work, but she also knows everybody else's work. And um, she's deeply interested in the concept of uh, self-efficacy and how self-efficacy connects with uh, uh, collective efficacy and uh, a whole host of other amazing accomplishments. Essentially, she, she created the professional development program at Corwin when she went there. And, um, but that's not what I wanna talk about, all the accomplishments, which are really great. Kristen is, Without question, and I think this is intentional on your part, but I think Kristen is one of the most affirmative people I know. She, she, she talks about her concept of unleashing the brilliance of other people. And she does it all the time. And I've seen people who are deeply dedicated to her because she affirms them in, in really heartwarming and beautiful ways. And she's so much fun and uh, such a good friend. And I'm so glad you're here. And I can't wait to get started. She's also going to be a presenter at the Teaching Learning Coaching Conference this year and has been a long-term partner for TLC. So Kristen, uh, welcome and let's go. Thank you so much, Jim. It's such a privilege to be here talking with you and uh, I always love any chance I can get to engage in dialogue with you and I learned so much from you. So thank you for having me. Well, um, it's not enough. However much time we get, it's not enough because life is too short. But I, I love, I, I've just loved working with you. You've been a huge influence on our organization, on the way I think about the work we do. So I'm excited to have the conversation. So I usually start with two different questions. And the first one is, um, what's something people don't know about you? So uh, something that people don't know about me. Well, I think uh, a lot of people don't know that when I was in college, uh, I spent a summer living in a homeless shelter, and I did that as part of a service to the families who lived there and uh, worked in kids programs and in the food pantry, and there was a little loft that was part of the shelter in Kansas City and uh, City Union Mission in Kansas City, and I uh, stayed there for a summer and did some support, and uh, it was transformative, to say the least. Not something I don't talk about very much uh, because I'm getting older and it seems like it was a long time ago. Yeah. I did not, you're not that old. I did not know that. So that is a great thing. So, so the other question I ask is what's something you're grateful for right now? Uh, something I'm grateful for. So if I could, let me just share with you what that is. I don't know if you can see my screen. I, I, I can see it. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, this, so this, as you know, Jim, this is my beautiful daughter, Lauren, and Lauren graduated high school about a week and a half ago. Uh, she, I love this picture because in a lot of pictures, you know, it's sunny Southern California, her eyes are squinting, you can't fully see them, but in this picture, you can see her beautiful blue eyes, and they remind me of what I'm most grateful for these last few months, which is every time I look at her, she's filled with so much joy, it's like the world is her oyster. There is nothing she can't do. She's going to the University of Kansas in a couple of months, uh, rock chalk, and uh, she has chosen to study education. Uh, she wants to be a teacher, uh, a school leader, and perhaps even a counselor. And uh, that was not by twisting of arm or influence. I told her to think about doing anything unless that she wants. And she said, mom, I've known I'm supposed to be an educator since I was little. And uh, KU just happens to have the ninth best uh, education program in the country right now. And so uh, she loves it there. She feels like it's home, uh, school spirit high, and her whole life is in front of her. And, and I'm not only grateful for that from a parenting perspective, but when I look at her in this photo, it reminds me of a quote from John Dewey when he talks about how, you know, what every parent wants for their own child, that should be the want for society. 
and looking at her with all of the joy in her eyes and what, you know, Paulo Freire says education is freedom and her working so hard and diligently over the last years has given her great freedom uh, and caused the fact that now, yeah, every choice is at her feet. Um, she, you know, she ended up with an amazing scholarship. She could choose to do anything, be anyone. And um, I think that that's, you know, kind of what, what parenting is about, what my mission in life is about, is that type of empowerment, but also what I want for every single kid in every school system in the world. So that's what I'm grateful for right now. So I just, uh, uh, I just love the fact that she had the world as her places. She had the whole world as her oyster, as you said. She could have chosen anywhere, and yet she chose the great University of Kansas. Just to, I can see it out the window if I look, if I, if I stretch my head over a little bit that way. So that's very wonderful. And uh, they're lucky to have her. If she's got any of her mom in her, she's going to be fantastic. And uh, well, we, you know, we're big fans of Lawrence, Kansas. So that's wonderful. Uh, I have these uh, questions. Uh, uh, you and I have talked before, and there's a transcript of our interview previously, so I wanted to do something a little bit differently. I'm calling this an intellectual travelogue, and so what I want to do is talk about books or ideas or people that have shaped you, and then we have some other questions that came in online. We can't do all the questions, but I picked a few of those questions we could talk through, and we'll just see where it goes, but... Um, what I thought we could do is if you could just mention a few of those things and we'll riff off those things. We'll, we'll be like Miles Davis and John Coltrane here, or maybe Alice Coltrane, and uh, we'll, we'll play it through. So, so what's the first book idea or person that you wanted to mention? Uh, so I think the first book, when I, when I went back to think of books that really shaped me, I immediately thought of The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, and uh, I know that's an interesting one, uh, but I remember kind of the world coming to life in a very profound and significant way uh, in reading that book. I think, first of all, it was in AP U.S. history when I was in high school, and it was the most rigorous class I've ever had. And it, the teacher consistently pushed us, but made history come to life and it was incredibly engaging. And he took us to Denver because I grew up in Longmont, Colorado, uh, which is about 30 minutes north of Denver. And he took us to Denver to see a play um, from a traveling group for the Grapes of Wrath. And it was the first time I had really spent any time in downtown Denver. It was the first time I'd ever seen a play. Uh, and I remember so vividly each element of the play including like the stage um actually sunk a part of it and uh it filled with water and there was an actual river along their travels uh and so that real life experience uh made it so compelling which is you know something i talk a lot with teachers now about which is having relevancy right and, and making things come to life in a way that we we don't just read words on a page but we experience them I also think uh, because in my upbringing, um, my parents uh, didn't have a lot of money and I know what that can do in terms of, you know, what you might do to get money or what your dreams are or how dreams are deferred. And so I think I personally related with the content in that book. And also just uh, a theme I was noticing through all the books I actually selected was this notion of dreaming for something or becoming, not being satisfied with who you are, but becoming, knowing that there's risk, um, great risk with our dreams, but uh, that one kind of stood out to me. I, it's hard for me to separate the book from the movie mm -hmm. uh, because the movie is so beautiful and uh, uh, with Henry Fonda and um, uh, it just captures kind of like those images from the prairies and uh, uh, during the depression and um, to me, it's a, a great, a great American poetic novel. And I'm, I, I think like, uh, I say Springsteen is our Steinbeck now. I mean, he's kind of, he's having, he's got a song about Tom Joe too, but I think it does capture something fundamental about America. I hadn't thought about the, well, I mean, I guess if I went back and read it, I would think about this, but what just struck me about there's something fundamentally American about that movie and in fact in Steinbeck in general. So that, yes. that's, that's very cool. Absolutely. Really interesting Plus, reflection on Bruce Springsteen there, bringing it to the modern age. I, well, I do you know the ghost of Tom Joad, that song, the ghost of Tom Joad, he's like, 
wherever there is a, I don't have the words memorized, but wherever there's a person who's down, look at, look at him and I'll be there. This idea of the universal connection between people. I think that's something that's maybe, especially at the end of the novel, it's been a while since I read it, like a few decades, but nonetheless, um, I used to teach it. I used to teach this course on travel themes and literature and film. And that was one of my core works. I just uh, love that. How hard it is to treat others with compassion given how oppressive the world is and how fundamentally important it is at the same time. Yeah. That's kind of what I, that I might be reading it through the Springsteen version of it, but that's what I'm remembering. <laughs> So well, what's it's next a, on your? It's such a beautifully written piece as well. You know the allegories and the metaphors, and um, it, I just remember being fascinated by his literacy or literary prowess uh, as well. So uh, yes. So my next title, uh, actually, I would say is Stuart, uh, and. Uh, I know uh, you have a fancy for Peter Block's stewardship as well. Uh, this book became incredibly important to me because I, I read it um, in many different settings, but one that I remember the most was uh, during my son's uh, indoor soccer tournament. He was in this like all day long tournament and he would play like a 30 minute indoor game and then sit with his team for two and a half hours and then play 30 minutes and sit with it. So it was a great day to read a book. Uh, and so I remember, you know, getting very wrapped with this book and uh, many of the ideas about, you know, kind of dismantling the patriarchy and the notion of giving power to the furthest edges of the organization and humanizing people uh, and also how powerful we are and how hope lies within us and our actions and what we can do. And this book stands out to me for a variety of reasons, but mostly because I designed my organization uh, in the back cover of the book. Uh, right. And so it was some ideas that came to me about how PD could be different, how we could be different and as a field. And uh, I can't say enough about that, but it, it, it struck me as I got this vision and then I just knew I had to go pursue the vision. So that's so interesting because I would say there's no partnership principles. There's no instructional coaching as we describe it. If it wasn't for Peter Block, Peter Block, and it was Michael Fullan who got me interested in Peter Block, but not stewardship. Stewardship, I bought at a Borders in Kansas City off Metcalf and they still had Borders bookstores. But um, when it came out, but it was transformative and it led to the partnership principles that led to instruct. So, so tell me about your diagram on the back, the, what PD could be. Uh, well, the idea was instead of doing PD at people, it was the idea of helping people build the competencies to do their own PD. And the notion behind that was, um, you know, kind of a DIY type of thing where we come in um, and, and I know this has been me in the past and sometimes it still is me and I think I'm learning and evolving, but people expect us to be experts. So we stand on the stage and we tell ideas and we, we feed into people very much like the industrial model of education kind of. And I always thought, well, aren't the people on site more brilliant than I am, really, because they're the ones on the ground doing the work, knowing it, the people, the environment, the context, all of the components. So it's just a matter of helping them see how brilliant they really are. And so what we've been devoting ourselves to over the past four years is this notion of how do we give educators the skills and the knowledge and the capabilities and the awareness so they can turn the light switch on and see how clever and how fierce and how capable they really are, um, which all started with stewardship. So, hmm. Wow. I did not realize what you're doing is you're giving them power tools for professional learning, right? Yes. Power tools for professional learning. I love that. They're going to rebuild their homes, but they're going to, they're going to use a skill saw instead of a hand saw. You know, yes. it's going to be a lot quicker if we have a jackhammer than if we have a sledgehammer. So mm -hmm. I don't know if a jackhammer is a power tool, but that's, that's. I, I'm with you. I mean, I don't know my power tools too well either, but jackhammer <laughs> applies action to me. So I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. What struck me about stewardship was, well, there's my friend Don Deschler um, and my mentor and uh, 
uh, boss and advisor and really important, one of the two or three most important people in my life. He says in life, there are two things. There's the time you've got and there's what you do with the time, the agency you have. And he said, uh, and then I've taken that and modified a little bit to say, and so when you take away a person's agency, it's really, it's really significant. You're taking one of the two most important things away from the person. You need to humanize them in some way. And what Peter Block is saying, we need to give people control over that aspect of their life. You know, give them the capacity to say yes and no and make choices and think for themselves and, and see ourselves more as stewards than as uh, bosses, people telling people what to do. So that book changed my life. That was a really, really great one. I can't wait to hear the other. Anything else you want to say about stewardship? Oh, I just, um, you know, one of the things that stood out to me, I think, in that book, too, is this notion of empowerment and how, you know, we are all wanting to be more empowered. And especially in education, I feel like we need a revival and empowerment of our being. And um, this, this piece from Peter Block where he said, empowerment is embodied in the act of standing our own ground, discovering our own voice, making And do not need permission to feel or to take matters in our own hands. And he said, you know, we are the starting point over and over again. And we rediscover our hope, not by having somebody else provide it, but providing it for ourselves. And so that notion of personal agency that you were just talking about, you know, reading so true with me as well. Very cool. Okay. Number three on our list. Mm -hmm. So, and these aren't power ranked. Okay, I just I want to be clear. Uh, but uh, the next one I would say is Parker, Parker Palmer and the courage to teach. And uh, he wrote a paper that goes alongside with the courage to teach called the heart of teaching. And uh, if you it, there, it's available for free download on the web, if any of you want to check it out. Uh, but he talked about this notion of the inner landscape of teaching. And I, I want to read this paragraph to you because this is really what struck me. He said, my concern for the inner landscape of teaching may seem indulgent, even irrelevant, at a time when many teachers are struggling simply to survive. Wouldn't it be more practical, I am sometimes asked, to offer tips, tricks, and techniques for staying alive in the classroom? things that ordinary teachers can use in everyday life. I've worked with countless teachers and many of them have confirmed my own experience. As important as methods may be, the most practical thing we can achieve in any kind of work is insight into what is happening inside us as we do it. The more familiar we are with our inner terrain, the more sure-footed our teaching and living becomes. And for me, that's kind of, it's, it's a mantra, to be honest. I am deeply concerned about the inner working of every teacher, of our inner selves, of who we show up as at work and at home uh, and what happens in there. There was a question that someone submitted for this session and they said, what's missing from professional learning in, through my own perspective? And I think what's missing in professional learning is development of the inner self for educators. Uh, and I think your work starts to get into that, Jim, um, quite a bit. And, and I feel like it's such a complex landscape. And yet it's the inner terrain that Parker Palmer speaks of that impacts our data teams. It impacts our ability to coach well. It impacts our ability to use instructional practices that double or triple the speed of learning or to even sit in our PLCs and create units of study. Whatever it is, I think the inner working of the teacher has been long neglected and we're at a time where we're losing one and two teachers between their third and fifth year in the field. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people have asked me, are you okay with your daughter becoming a teacher because uh, it's just a hectic field, she'll be more stressed, she'll get less pay. And I'm like, yes, she is the light, she's the hope, she is, we, and we need that light and that hope very much, but in order to get there and especially when it comes to wellness. You know, there's a clarion call in the field right now to focus on students' social emotional learning. Well, a 2019, you know, many studies, and as current as a 2019 study suggests, 
that students' wellness comes from the teacher's wellness. It doesn't, it doesn't come from a curriculum. It comes from the adult around them who has high efficacy and takes risks and is innovative and who brings hope and optimism and resiliency or is full of the personal resources of well being. Uh, and in order to accomplish that, we have to start talking about that inner landscape. And I think from what I've read, researched, and seen in the field, it's not at the exception of student achievement. It's at the promotion of student achievement and student social emotional well being. Everything we want comes from that inner terrain of the educator. I could talk about this all day, so I'll just stop there. I oh, don't need to stop. I, I, I love it. And, and of course, Parker Palmer is a huge influence on uh, our work. And if there's an interior landscape in our stuff, it's probably influenced by Parker. I did, he was the winner of last year's, of, I'm sure you recall. Don Deschler Leadership Award, and, and we did a, you know, I did a, have the chance to talk with him for about 90 minutes. I just soaked up every minute I could get. And um, yeah, he's a, a real um, beautiful soul, you know, he's just really uh, uh, influential and powerful. But here, here's my question, and it's okay to say, gee, I don't know about that one, Jim, but if I'm a teacher, Next year, it's my second year, and it's really my first year. And last year, you know, 2020 to 2021, one week it was hybrid. Next week it was, okay, now we're going to go exclusively Zoom. Okay, now we're going to go face-to-face. -face. I don't know what's coming, but it's going to be something else. And 30% of my kids aren't even showing up on the screen. And I'm supposed to, I don't, you know, now I'm coming back. Uh, I could... I think you're the, probably the best person I can think of to answer this question, but I got to have a lot of questions about my efficacy. I could be saying, I don't think this is the job for me. This is just too hard and I'm not doing a good job and I'm letting my kids down and I'm overwhelmed and I'm not happy. Like I, I look in the mirror and I look older because of this job. So how do we, how do we support that person? How do we support a, a teacher who's really wrestling with efficacy in, in light of all that he or she has had to deal with? Yeah. Well, and that actually leads me to a couple of books, uh, too, which is Self-Efficacy, The Exercise of Control by Albert Bandura uh, and The Progress Principle by Teresa Amabile and Stephen Kramer. Both of those have been quite formative in my work. And the notion of drastic change has been with us forever. In fact, in 1987, when Bandura published Self-Efficacy, The Exercise of Control, a quote I lifted from the introduction is rapid cycles of drastic changes require continuous personal renewal. These challenging realities place a premium on people's sense of self-efficacy to shape their future. I'm going to and, interrupt for a sec. Yeah. Could you say that again? Rapid, what's the, give rapid me the whole cycles thing. of drastic changes require continuous personal renewal. Great. These, yeah. And so the notion is in 1987, he was writing about how the field um, and people in general in society is rapidly and drastically changing. And so the one thing we know for certain is that will always be the case. That's never going to stop. And our field tends to innovate and, and rapidly evolve much more than many others. Uh, and the pressures just seem to keep mounting. And so ownership of our locus of control in a world that's filled with outputs is imperative, right? Um, you know, that goes all the way back to Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, where, you know, habit one is to be proactive and not reactive. And that notion of owning that locus of control, because honestly, when we focus on all of the things that are happening at us, decisions that leaders are making, decisions that states are making, you know, implementing this, do this, um, follow these rules and regulations, it sucks the life right out of us. And it's so much noise that fills our head and makes us devoid of hope. What, what I know about educators is educators have the highest influence out of any other stakeholder on a student's overall achievement. I know that educators are infinitely powerful, and I don't just know this from one place. I know this from several dimensions of research. 
whether you look at the RAND um, Commission reports from 2012 and 2019, or if you look at um, John Hattie's visible learning research and what sits at the top of the research, the majority of it is what is within a teacher's control and influence. And so I know that we are infinitely powerful if we choose to focus in on the zone we actually can influence instead of the noise that drowns all the goodness out. And so part of that is saying, okay, I am going to focus on what's within my classroom, what's within my school, what I can do to make positive change. And the second part of that is within the progress principle, the second book I referenced is that notion of we have to get small wins evident to teachers on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, this notion of there is the best way to motivate people day in and day out is facilitating progress, even small wins. And even in the most overwhelming situations, that's always the best way to motivate people. The problem is, is in our field, we don't often celebrate or acknowledge or look for short term wins because we're in this perpetual cycle that, you know, nothing is enough or we can never be enough or, you know, we're working toward massive end of year goals that are tied to big achievement scores, you know, or even, you know, quarter goals or whatever the case is. And I need to know when I wake up in the morning that I have a purpose today. And when I go to bed at night, I need to know if I am winning and if I am making a difference with that purpose. Um, you know, some people call that, you, you can get that through um, five minute journaling, for example, where you set an intention for the day uh, at the beginning of the day of something that will help you feel like you are making progress if you complete it. And then you reflect on that at night and that small act of knowing you win all the time, like every day you're winning, you're accomplishing something that can reorient our belief in ourselves. It can make our efficacy grow. It can help us overcome obstacles. It helps us be more resilient and it helps us drown out the noise of all the crazy around us. Not that I'm not interested in reforming the system that also creates this, but knowing what we can control and influence, we, we are infinitely powerful and we can Rick Stiggins quotes as he says, our goal is to get every kid on a winning streak and to keep them there. Well, our goal is to get every teacher on a winning streak and to keep them there, you know, to get to get every leader on a winning streak and keep them there so that they are so DJ Khaled, all they do is win, 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 right? That's a, you know, a song I run to sometimes. Uh, but all of that to say, you know, that that we have within our power what we need to do to make this field work for us instead of against us, no matter how tough the obstacles are. It's what I'm reading a lot about. And again, I will stop because I can talk. No, oh, I don't want you to stop, but I, I do have a question, which again, I don't know if there's an answer to it. When I just finished this book called The Definitive Guide to Instructional Coaching, and I have a section on questions, and it says you should ask questions that are challenging enough that they're interesting to answer and easy enough that you can actually answer them. And I don't know if this is easy enough that you can actually answer it, but why is it so hard? Uh, why is it that so many people self-sabotage themselves? We have so much, as Kristen Neff says, so much self-criticism and uh, so many people feeling like they're imposters and they're not really, they're going to be found out any day now. You know, where, where do you think, is that social pressure, competition around us or or what? Have you, in, in your looking at self-efficacy, have you, have you had a chance to explore, because I'm sure you're, you're, you're gonna look at it, but have you a chance to explore why it is so hard to feel good about what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a whole lot of there there. I think, first of all, our brains are hardwired to look for what's wrong with us instead mm -hmm. of what's good or right. Uh, and, and so we're very tempted and, and we don't look at our strength and we don't look at what we're doing right. And, and the other thing is the job is huge. So if we're, if we're always only looking toward the long-term, we will feel like we're never accomplishing anything because the needs are so ubiquitous, right? And so the notion of making sure that we're aware of what success looks like now, as opposed to success down the road, and we have to just keep going and 
And as Brene Brown says, hustling for worthiness because we are trying everything we can, but we just can't get there. Uh, I, I think that that has a lot to do with it. I mean, also the fact that we don't have enough conversations about belief building and how to improve our own self-efficacy and you know, encouragement to take the time to be vulnerable and work through these complex layers. And to say, you know, I, I am really doubting myself in this area. I need people. Um, and, and to know that that's okay. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us. It's nature of being human that, you know, being alive means I am a hot mess and a work of art all at the same time. And that I constantly am in need of improvement. And so, um, and I, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, the, one of the last ones that I picked for my list was Renee Brown, The Gifts of Imperfection. Um, that book wrecks me every single time I read it. And uh, I've read it a few times now and uh, do a book study for women leaders in education. And we just went through that book. Uh, and, uh, you know, when talking about accepting ourselves for who we are, understanding the big challenge in front of us, being vulnerable, afraid, and brave all at the same time, and owning our story and loving ourselves in that process, knowing that I am fully incomplete, that there are massive challenges, and yet I can still make an incredible difference. And um, she has a prayer at the end of the introductory section of the 10th anniversary edition that I think is really beautiful. She says, may we find the courage to let go of who we think we're supposed to be so that we can fully embrace our authentic selves. The imperfect, the creative, the vulnerable, the powerful, the broken, and the beautiful. May we show ourselves and others the compassion that comes from knowing that we're all made of strength and struggle. May we create a just and equitable world where privilege isn't a prerequisite for self-expression and authenticity, and where everyone feels invited and safe to express their power and their vulnerability. And last, may we experience the strength of connection, the love of belonging, and the grace of pure joy. And so what I would say is, as educators, we need to not be afraid to be our authentic, wholehearted selves. And that means good, bad, and ugly. And it means that very notion of being human means I have low efficacy in certain contexts. I have high efficacy in certain contexts. I'm working on plans right now to bolster my self-efficacy in a variety of personal and professional lenses, because by being alive, it means that I don't have it all figured out yet, because perfectionism is a myth. It is not real, and it's a place we'll never get to. I've got two, two thoughts about that. One of them is uh, one of the people I know who is one of the most accomplished people I've ever met in my life. I asked him once, I said, do, do you ever like doubt yourself? And I thought, well, this person is like on the pinnacle of success. And he said, um, oh, all the time. He says, I, yeah. He said, we went through a phase where I was wondering if we're having any impact at all. And I was like, my goodness, if he feels like he's, he's got doubts. What is, what am I supposed to do? Like kind of yeah. was uh, a powerful conversation. And then the other thing is I love the phrase, Krista Neff. I think she's the one who says it or also I've taken it. It's certainly what her book's all about that. We should treat each other. We should treat ourselves like someone we love uh, with that same yes. kind of compassion. And the opposite happens. What she articulates really nicely is how, or clearly uh, is how um, we say things in our heads to ourselves that we wouldn't dream of saying to another person. We actually wrote down the thoughts we're thinking and we read them aloud and said, would I say that to another person? We'd be horrified. It's like abuse, the stuff we, we say in our heads. So it so much is. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating because especially in education, we're really good at saying beautiful, empowering, and humanizing things to other people as we coach, as we lead, as we mentor, because we believe in their human potential. But that it, when it comes down to and how we speak to ourselves, and including me, it's a trap I get in constantly. I'm trying to be more aware of my chatter, uh, as Ethan Cross calls it, or that, that cognitive loop of how I speak to myself in certain situations. Wow. But I, I think um, it's, it's an evolution. And again, if, if we don't create the space to pay attention to that, 
you know, if we're just going, going, going constantly, and then we're feeling like we're never enough, and we're feeling like we can't win, then what happens is we never reach that area where we feel like we can become a little better at it every day. Um, because we're just not making the space for the conversations internally and externally to be able to process the information. And that's kind of my dream for school systems is that we would purposely create that space, that we would create a learning space to dive into concepts like efficacy and hope, hope being a, an incredible cognitive deep process, not some touchy feely ethereal thing, resiliency, optimism, habit forming, um, the notion of, you know, being empowered with self-compassion, all the things that you're talking about, if we could create that space, not just for the learning, but also for the doing and the reflection, I think everything else we want to come into line will come back into play. Uh, and I, I think I'm starting to work with some very daring and brave systems who are starting to privilege the inner work life of the educators. Um, because we're seeing well-being just plummet, right, across the board. I mean, we're seeing anger and fights for no reason. We're seeing people who take little problems and make them into huge things right now. We're seeing people who are checked out emotionally. We're seeing, you know, and, and or the people who have been fighting, 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 and they're just burned out. They're stressed. They're drained. Uh, and it's, you know, I think we're at a critical moment in our field where if we don't start paying attention to that inner terrain, we're, we're going to have quite a problem ahead. So. Well, we probably already got a problem. I yeah. mean, it, uh, this time in and of itself, the trouble with this time is you were talking about how we we're wired to see things negatively. What struck me is, yeah, and so are all the other people around us. And they don't necessarily see us necessarily, and the, they might say nice things, but there is a real sense in which we see the negative. And it's probably evolutionary, just it's a way to stay alive. We wanna watch for the snake in the grass or the lion in the forest or whatever, so it doesn't eat us. Yeah. But still, uh, we notice what's different, but, um, but in light of what we've all gone through, we've, we've spent a year with people not at their best and it wears you down and we're not at our best. And so, uh, so to me, getting through this year in and of itself is just a really great accomplishment. You know, if you're oh still God. in education and you've made it, you've done something be beautiful. So beautiful. Um, educators cool. are incredible. Yeah, they are. Infinitely. Now, have we used up all your books and uh, ideas or do you have mo any more on your list? I have one more because great. I couldn't pick my most influential books and talk with you without picking one of your most influential books for me. So right. I picked Better Conversations. Um, it is my favorite book that you have written uh, in the suite. I think because for me, it crosses along all lines, right? Personal, professional, and you know, it speaks to that inner, inner life as well. Uh, and uh, at the very beginning, uh, when you quote Margaret Wheatley, and you talk about how she says, you know, I believe we can change the world if we start listening to one another again, simple, honest human conversation. And it reminds me of even going to one of your first workshops and talking about the word dialogue being the root of two words, dia and logos. Uh, and how it's a back and forth conversation um, or exchange of words that leaves both parties in a better place than they were before they left. And, you know, that dialogue, those conversations, you say that, you know, so much of our joy and sorrow is derived from those conversations. And I think it's so true. And, and taking the time to cultivate those conversations, including better conversations with ourselves, as you were just mentioning. Um, but the way we talk with ourselves and the way we talk with others, I think has a, a deliberate impact. And I know, like, for example, um, my business partner, he is a genius. And every time I have the privilege of sharing space with him, I leave completely changed. Like I went in with my ideas. And by the end of the conversation, I am on a completely different plane. And that's what the power of dialogue can do and, and, and the power of, you know, um, relationships. And so you for contributing the book because I have pulled it off my shelf year after year after year and continuously quote it. And uh, I think I'm not alone in saying the power of that book on, uh, on lives of educators. So. so you know where that book came from? From Jim Knight. 
<laughs> yeah, but you know how I came to write that book? I was, in this, I was in this very room with Kristen Anderson. And I said, I'm trying to figure out what the next thing I should do is. And you said, well, why don't you create like a workbook for all the communication stuff you've done? See how it goes. And so it's all your fault. You're yeah. the one who got the ball rolling. It all started with you right here. You were sitting like right over there. <laughs> and you said, you should do this. And then it, and it was such a cool thing to do because um, it was kind of like hitting the sweet spot with the baseball and a baseball bat. It just felt like this is the thing to do. And so, uh, so you're the hot, you're, you, you, you were the initial push down the hill to make it happen. And then it just was like, get in the car, go for the ride. So it all comes back to you. Um, okay. So I've got some more questions. There's some, so let me ask you one in particular. I started off this introduction by saying, I know very few people who are more affirmative of others than you. And that I think it's intentional. I think that you're, it's not just, you just don't happen to be a nice person, but you are intentional. In fact, uh, I don't know if you saw the interview. I interviewed Sally Helgeson a few months ago, who's a uh, Forbes called her the world's greatest uh, leader of women, right? women leadership expert. I asked her about a person she mentioned and she said what made her unique and special as a leader was her intentionality, mm -hmm. that she never did anything without being intentional. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering, how did you come to be, just tell me about the whole business of how, how you happen to be such an affirmative person of other people. How did that come to be? What's behind it? Were you just surrounded by super nice people and you just picked it up? Like, uh, how did it happen to be? I'm not, not certain I was surrounded by super nice people all the time. Uh, I, you know, I, I love my parents and, uh, and also I, I don't know that they were most positive human beings all the time. Uh, I think, I think for me, and I remember this ever since I was, um, you know, in high school was I, I look at people and all I can see is what they are and what they can be, not what they're not. And, uh, and that has been true and played out in so many different ways. I've had the privilege of mentoring consultants um, through the Leadership and Learning Center and through Corwin and the professional learning um, you know, businesses that I kind of helped. And uh, every time it's been super easy because I feel like I'm just being myself. Like I'm in a room with a human and I pay attention to them and I see in their eyes what brings life to them and makes them shine or what makes their heart sing and I want to draw that out and I want people to live in their strengths I want them to see what they're capable of and that's why my company is called the brilliance project because it's all about I, I believe truly that every human being is individually and then of course collectively but individually brilliant and that there's so much capacity that we don't draw out because we're petty or because we get jealous or because we're worried about ourselves and our own or whatever the case is. But at the end of the day, people are extraordinary. And there, there is not one person I've met who doesn't attribute, cannot attribute something that is life-changing. And I feel like if every educator were to realize that, whether you're an educator of adults, if you teach in the university space, if you're a professional developer, if you're in K-12, if you're a leader, if all of us were to take a chance to stop and to realize our brilliance, our giftedness, and to have the courage to leverage that in our workplaces, we would have a nuclear power outage of giftedness and shine so bright. And, and I do think it's a courageous path. I, one of the uh, strings across the books I chose was a lot of it was about being brave in and of yourself, personal agency, dreaming about who you can be and what you are. And I think it just is a natural piece of me. I mean, even if you um, look at the strengths finder, um, one of my strengths finder is developer. I see things in people and I want to call them out because I want them to live their best lives and feel like they are you know, in a zone. And um, for, you know, I, I'm kind of one of those people who believes if you need to say something, you just say it. And even if people think you're crazy, and even if people think that you're like, 
you know, it, because I'm sure a lot of people have thought I'm crazy when I'm like, you need to write that book. You should stop everything and become a consultant. You know, you are, you're on fire. You need to take that dream and run with it. But, you know, I, I quit a very corporate job in pursuit of my own dream. And I, I am fully about living that, that life where you can look, you know, at the end of your life and say, I, I, I've left nothing nothing left to give like I've fully put it out there and if that's something that I know is I'm, I'm gonna tell you whether you like it or not it's just um and now I am much more I mean that's that's what an educator is right the root of edu educator is educo and so, and I feel like that's what we do in the classroom for kids. It's what we do for the adults we work with. And that's a high responsibility. Like for the people you're around, do you draw out their potential and leave them in a better place? And so that's kind of my own personal mission. So let's look at an example of what we're talking about here. So we sat in this room and uh, after you uh, got me started writing better conversations. It ended up, we wrote a book and Jenny wrote the reflection guide to go with it. So we had a book then we had a workshop that goes with it. Then we sat in this room and Kara was here and Jenny Donahue was here and Peter DeWitt was here and they become global consultants because of the books they wrote. When they were here, none of that had happened, but you're the one who inspired the book in the first place, or at least got the book started. You're the one who brought those people together and then they've gone on to do really, really great things. It's uh, astonishing what you've accomplished in terms of mentoring other people at your ridiculously young age. Yeah, I know it's hard to believe you even have a high school uh, student going to college. But. That too. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Um, yes, no, but that's it. You must See, sit back and, though, and look at those people and go, oh, wow, that's no, quite I'm something. So, I'm so proud of them. I mean, you know, to, to have the courage to, because for, for me to say something is one thing, for people to actually take the actions and the steps to make things happen, you know, for you to wrestle with all of this content and to put it into such a lovely book, you know, for, for consultants to say, I am going to take a pause on what I thought I was doing and I'm going to take a little bit of a risk and, and offer this so educators can thrive. I mean, I'm so proud of people who do that and it doesn't matter who that is. Like I, I have the, the privilege of coaching a lot of district and school leaders. And one of the things I love, like today I'm celebrating with a colleague of mine who um, I've been able to coach for the last couple of years. And she made a decision that she wanted a greater challenge and she is not someone who leaves things. She's always trying to be very comfortable. And she made a decision to take the next leap to get a principalship at a school she really wanted. And Today is her last day of her old chapter and tomorrow is the first day of her new chapter. Wow. And it's just so, so beautiful to see people becoming, you know, I think Michelle Obama's book is really beautiful too, by the way, I'm becoming and just that notion of we're alive to become the next better version of ourselves constantly. And that's a model for our kids and for what we need to accomplish in education. And if it's, you know, if it's in us and it, takes a few words to draw it out. It's it's really the person who then accesses that agency and makes it happen. And I just admire that so much. So um, I am very honored to have played a small piece in, in all of those people's lives and, and much more honored, I think, just to, to see the impact that those choices have had. So it's it's a cool thing to see what what all's happened. OK, I have a few more questions here. Uh, what steps can be taken to ensure educators don't lose hope during these overwhelming times? You've been addressing this, but I wanted to give you a chance to add to it. And, and have you learned any new tips, despite what Parker Palmer said, uh, during this very different, different year we have all just had? So in other words, given what we've gone through, what advice do you have us as we move forward? Yeah, I mean, I think the small wins piece is huge because when everything is changing so fast and you feel done and dusted continuously and it's everything you can do just to get up and face it again, if you, you've got to purposefully program some small wins. Um, just like you know, Biden took over the presidency, his first 100 days are purposefully programmed with tons of wins. And that's not just to get the country moving in a certain direction or to say he's a great leader, it's for his own belief. 
his own efficacy that mm. I can do this. I can make this happen. We can make progress. And it, I feel like every teacher, every hundred days should have a hundred day plan, you know, and, and that feeling of, of constant victory um, because, and, and even calling it our victory list, reminding ourselves of all the things we're capable of, uh, you know, C.R. Snyder, um, a University of Kansas, uh, very profound thinker, he did a lot of research on hope. And as you know, Jim, he noted that hope is a cognitive process. It's not touchy-feely, it's a cognitive process of having goals, having pathways to hitting those goals and having agency or the belief in ourselves and the ownership that we can make it happen. And so what brings about hope right now, it is victories and, and consistent ones. And especially now more than ever, um, being very attuned with what will success look like today? What will success look like this week? How am I measuring it? What's important to me? Uh, and, and, and we know that that is hope. See, here's the thing is there are decades of research about efficacy, about hope, about well-being and wellness. And all the latest fads are not going to do anything for that well-being or that hope or that efficacy. Um, we don't have a lack of knowing. We don't have a gap because of lack of knowing. We have a knowing doing gap, right? Because we, we haven't immersed ourselves enough in the tools in order to make, to make it happen. And so when we think about, um, you know, how can I make hope happen right now? I think part of it is giving ourselves the permission to spend time on ourselves. Um, you know, if you look at books that are out right now around educator wellness or well-being, they're on, you know, 50 things you can, 50 tiny practices that you can do, or, you know, 50 mindfulness habits or all these little tricks. Well, the inner life of ourselves, it's not full of tips and tricks and tools. It's rugged, complex terrain that requires a long-term reflective effort. Uh, and, and so what I would say is um, not looking toward the fads. You know, it's, it's funny because uh, I don't know if any of you watched Modern Family, but uh, there's this episode of Modern Family where it's Claire's massage day, Claire being the mom of one of the families. And the dad and the kids love massage day because she comes home and she's like in this touchy feely, like super positive mood. And so for Claire on massage day. So for a month, it's like all the things they would normally want to ask her, but they are too scared to say no. They store it up and then they jockey for rank of who gets to ask first when she gets in the door. And uh, then, you know, she gets home from this massage day and it's, mom, I can't go on family vacation. Mom, I want to move here, you know, whatever the case is. And then halfway through, she figures it out and she goes, you are just playing on my good nature because I'm happy after this massage. And, you know, it's, it's funny because we think that yoga or massage or some of these things that seem like, oh, I can just take a stress day or a personal day and that'll make everything better. Those are just band-aids for a much larger issue that, and it's through we start dealing with the issue. The other thing about yoga and massage and some of like the mindfulness techniques and those types of things is they're just temporal. They don't resolve anything. They don't change anything. They just put us in this state of bliss. And don't get me wrong. I love a good massage. I would not refuse one if somebody wanted to give me one. Uh, not, never a problem. But the issue is when does the massage wear off and when does real life come back? Just like Christmas vacation or a holiday vacation. You know, we are burned out, stressed beyond belief, wonder if we can make it through the second semester before we leave for the holidays. And then the first day when we get back, we're like, oh my gosh, I have all these ideas. I can change the world. I'm energized. But then by Wednesday, you're already in a funk again or frustrated because all of the stressors that existed before and our old ways of dealing with them still exist. So instead of, of these simple tricks and, and band-aids or masks that we put on things, it's time that we really start delving into the landscape. How do I build my personal resources to build my well-being, and how do I make that endure and last for the long haul? In other words, I am, an, as an educator, I'm the most valuable resource in the system. How do we start 
privileging the full resource instead of the one that can just do and work and make things happen. So. I love it. And uh, my back hurts, so I could go for the massage right now. Actually. Oh, yeah, no, never a problem. <laughs> and we should probably get your back looked at just to make I've sure got, it's okay. <laughs> oh, trust me. I've got x-rays on my iPhone. Um, uh, last question. And again, to some extent, you've answered this, but uh, it is kind of a unique and interesting question. Uh, what are some ideas you have that have helped educators inspire change in their administrators who may have initially not been in agreement with your approach to your style of professional learning? In other words, how do we coach administrators? Uh, if that is our, well, I'm paraphrasing the question. The question's pretty clear. So what are your thoughts about that one? Yeah, you know. No easy questions here. Oh, I love the questions. Uh, you have a brilliant network of people who are providing questions uh, and they're, they're spot on. So something that I'm hearing underlying in that question comes up time and time again in the phrase, I'm just a teacher what can I do? And I hear this often, you know, I want to lead change. I want to inspire things. I want to disrupt the patriarchy. I want, you know, whatever it is that educators want to do. And it's, I'm just a teacher. So what can I really do to make that change? And, and I'm here to tell you that that language and that thought process has got to leave. You are not just an educator. You are a fierce, infinitely capable human being who has the privilege of creating massive change. And so if knowing that and coming from that standpoint, if you are passionate about something that you know is best for your kids because you've looked at empirical evidence or scientific evidence, you have looked at experiential data, you have looked at you know, organizational data around you know, absences and tardies or whatever, and you've gone through a process where you know what you want to do will lead to the change that you know you need to make. Then you go in your room and you unleash your personal power and you get it done. Because pretty soon what will happen is people will start recognizing. Why did they start raising scores? Why are their kids learning at different ways? Why is there so much joy in that classroom? What's happening there? And it will catch people's attention and it will cause a wildfire uh, in a very positive sense of the word. I mean, the biggest thing to remember is every person in the system, even if they have a title, they're a human being. Anyone can influence anyone or anything. And the best way to create influence is by getting it done. Um, by going in and doing that which you want to do, not because it's a pet project or something that you just really love, but because you know it gets results and it's proven. Because again, we have all the knowledge and the evidence we need. Getting in, getting it done, and then showing through the efficacy of your work, uh, I think is the most powerful way. And can I've seen in many systems can create change. I, 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 Agree completely, and uh, I'm I'm thinking as you're talking, unleash your personal power. Now, there's a title for your book. I think I think that's a good one to go. We should check it on Google right away. You should lock down the the website right. Locking now. it down. <laughs> right, and so your website. If people want to get learn more about you, where do they go to? The Brilliance Project is it brilliance dot com. What's the what's the website com. again? Yeah, so we we have both. URLs. At first, when we started our company, we couldn't get the .com, uh, so we had .net. Uh, but then the .com was available for sale, and uh, it's just it had to have it. So we are thebrilliantsproject.com, and uh, you can get in touch with me there. You can get in touch with me on um, just email, Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, at thebrilliantsproject.com, and I would love to chat with you about any of this uh, or anything else. As well. And you can learn more about Kristen at the Teaching Learning Coaching Conference. I just got news yesterday. Dan Pink is going to be one of our keynoters. Ooh, so, how exciting you know, is that? Liz Wiseman, who you taught me about, she's one of our keynoters. And uh, Isabel Wilkerson, who I think her book should be compulsory reading on it, the part of every Marsha Tate, Christian mm -hmm. Neuerberg. And then uh, you're going to be a big part of it. We've got you on a 
we're, we're loading you up with things to do. So people will be able to see you at TLC too. Well, um, I'm so just, honored. I love TLC. It's uh, one of my favorite events of the year and uh, just honored to be a part of it. And what a lineup. I mean, and, and really, uh, you know, reflective of the things we've talked about today. Multipliers is helping people unleash their potential and making people bigger just by a presence of being a leader. And, you know, Dan Pink talks a lot about progress and, and the need, the fundamental need for progress that reflects our drive. And, um, oh my goodness, I cannot wait for the event. Can't wait to learn with everyone. Everybody gets a copy of Liz Wiseman's new book, which is about um, uh, e excellent performers, outstanding mm -hmm. performers, kind of the opposite of multipliers. What makes a person really, truly outstanding? And everybody gets a copy of Dan Pink's new book, which is about regret and overcoming Ooh. regret. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Pink's book comes later because it doesn't come till it's out. You can't get it till it's re ready, but we'll be the first ones in line. And oh, uh, we're looking forward to the, your book, Unleash Your Personal Power. That's going to be a great one too. So I'm working um, on it. <laughs> good. Uh, Kristen, I'm so grateful. I love our conversations, every single one. And uh I love your idea. Uh, the thing that I took away today that struck me the most is that sort of victory scorecard of, uh, and the idea of a hundred day plan for the start of the school year. I think that's really, really a powerful thing. Let's, let's, let's build in a whole yes. bunch of victories to build our efficacy and also to just to increase the likelihood of success. I think that's really, we get hung up on, I want my scores to go up by the end of the year, but what's happening every week in terms of progress are we That's seeing right. progress every weekend and and i'll just note number one it's not arrogant number two it's not self-serving i mean like for the bad reasons or for wrong reasons it is vital to our survival um and every person even people who we deem as successful or that we think have their act together we all need to remind be reminded of who we are because here's what happens is our brains play on the past. So if we perceive that we're not accomplishing anything, or if we're not getting something done, then our mind will tell us the next time we go into a similar scenario that we can't do it, that we're not good enough, that we are an imposter, whatever the case is. If we remind ourselves, especially after a pandemic, where you found what you're capable of and saw how you could change your practice and everything you could be, if you created a victory list after this pandemic of all the things you're proud of yourself for, the things you tried, what you accomplished, and you use that, you put it right next to your computer or it's on your phone, every time you're faced with a new challenge, you will remember how you showed up and the fact that if I could do this, there is nothing I am not capable of. And, and that's really, really the mindset. I love it. And I'm making my own personal victory list. Yeah, uh, I want you to share it with me. And my hundred, my hundred day plan is coming up, definitely. Ooh, can't so, wait. I, I, and and it's all thanks to you, like many other things, all thanks to you. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you. We'll talk soon, but we'll see you at TLC. All right, can't wait. Thank you, Jim. Thank all you, right. everybody. <laughs> bye bye.